Hey everyone, my name is Matt and this is a truckload of black walnut lumber that was freshly milled a few weeks ago. So it's still wet and needs to dry. So in this video I'm going to show you how I air dry this lumber. So let's get started on just talking about what you need to do to get started. So let's say you just cut some lumber, what do you need to do next? Now the first thing you really want to do is seal up the end grain of the lumber you just milled up. Now you can do this a few different ways. There's a product here that I use, this is called Anchor Seal. It's specially formulated just for sealing up end grain and preventing moisture loss. It's a really waxy paint-like substance that goes on sort of like latex paint, but then it dries clear and waxy, so it works really well. Now you can also use latex paint. It doesn't work quite as well as actually an end grain sealer, but it's a lot better than doing nothing at all. And what sealing up the end grain does is, is it keeps the boards from actually splitting and checking on the ends. Now by sealing up the end grain, you're reducing the risk of that happening. Now, I mean, it's totally possible that it would still split after you applied that sealer or it might not split at all if you didn't apply the sealer. But it's a nice little insurance policy, so to speak. Now, a really important aspect of drying your own lumber is where you're going to keep it because it needs to dry for a certain duration of time and usually it's more than just a couple months even. So having a nice location for it to be in that whole time is going to be very critical. Now for that location you want it to be you know, dry and out of the elements and also really flat. A lot of the work in preparing the site is really just making sure that that base is nice and level and flat. If you were to stack your lumber in a place where the, the ground or the, whatever you're stacking it on is not flat, you're going to cause your whole stack of lumber to basically conform to that shape. So if the area we are stacking on has a crown in the middle and it goes like this, all your boards are going to end up with a, a basically a bow in them. Or if the area is twisted, all your boards are going to have a twist in them as well. Because as they dry, they're going to try and maintain that stage or that shape that they were in as they were drying. So what I do is I dry all my lumber in my basement. The slab in there is pretty flat. There are a few places where I need to shim out to make it a little flatter, but the spot that I'm using right now for this video is actually already really flat. Now to check that, I went in there with a straight edge and just made sure that it was straight corner to corner and um, across the whole width. And that makes sure that my stack will be nice and straight and my boards will end up nice and flat as well once they're dried. Now once you've got that area nice and flat and situated, you can really get started on stacking your lumber. Now there's a few things that I do in preparation as well of the boards before I bring them in and stack them. Now the first thing I'm going to do besides sealing up the end grain is brush off any loose sawdust that might be on them. That does a couple things for me. One, it keeps a lot of that sawdust out of my house, which is nice. But the other thing it does is it prevents mildew and mold from growing on my lumber as it's drying. What that sawdust does on the surface of the board is keep moisture in there. And that, the longer the moisture stays in there, especially in an open, kind of more porous environment like inside of sawdust, that's going to be an excellent place for mold and mildew to grow and that's something you don't want in your lumber stack. Now you might be wondering about insects, and yes, insects are definitely a risk that might be involved with drawing your own lumber. So I have the, the ability, or at least the, well, the convenience of, I have to move every single one of my boards one by one in. And as I move them in, I not only remove the sawdust from them, but I also inspect them for any kind of insect signs. So any kind of holes or anything like that where it might show that there were insects there at some point, a lot of the times it's hard to tell if they're actually still there. So if you have any questions about whether you have insects in the wood, I would just set those aside and deal with them later instead of trying to stack them in the stack and hope for the best. Now one thing about insect activity though is a lot of that stuff is going to be in the bark. So if you're not bringing in a whole lot of stuff that has a live edge on it, it's not as big of a risk, but there are insects that will be burrowing into the wood that you do have to be concerned with. But those are very obvious as well as you're moving those boards you can see all the little holes in the boards and you'll know that there were insects there at some point. So now that you're ready to start stacking, let's talk about stickering. And a sticker is just a little board that goes between the stacks of lumber and that provides airflow around the whole board. And that can be made out of pretty much anything, or at least I haven't had a problem with anything I use for a sticker. Um, the other thing with stickers is you need to determine how thick a sticker you want to make them. Now, traditionally or most commonly, these are going to be about three quarter by three quarters square. And the square stock just makes it easier for, you know, setting them on there. You don't have to worry about which direction is up or down, or side to side or whatever. Now this one here, this is made out of cherry, and this is three quarter inches thick and about an inch wide, or an inch and a quarter wide. Now if you really want to get fancy with your stickers, you can run a cove or a V groove 
on the top and bottom and that reduces the amount of contact space the sticker has with the board which should in turn reduce any kind of possible sticker staining you might have. And sticker staining is basically just when you have strips or stripes across the boards where the stickers used to be and that's kind of just stained in there and, and it's hard to remove. Now something interesting about the stickers themselves or the size of them is there's a couple of variables that they influence. And one is the stack of the, or the height of the stack or how much they contribute to the height of the stack and how much empty space there is in the stack of wood. And the thicker they are, the more airflow there is, or the easier it is to get airflow around all the boards. Now a three quarter inch sticker is pretty common, but I use half inch stickers because I do my stuff inside and I have limited ceiling height. So a half inch sticker allows me to stack more lumber in the same square foot area. The only downside to that is that I need to be a little more cautious or conscientious about how much airflow I have going around the stack. And also with that, the size of your stack is going to impact how much airflow gets through it as well. I typically do a four foot wide stack and with a half inch thick sticker in there, I need to be very, very careful about how much air I put in there or making sure I have enough air going through there. So I use a fan to circulate air through the stack and that helps a lot. If I didn't use a fan though, this thickness of sticker would be very difficult to maintain a natural airflow through there at least indoors, and that would cause mildew and mold, which is something you don't want in your stack of lumber anyway. <laughs> but with a three quarter inch one, it really, that's kind of like the happy medium, I think. You have enough air naturally going through the boards and you don't have to worry about the mildew as much. Now, as I was saying, I, I've tried a whole bunch of different type of materials for stickers. Uh, really, I use whatever I have lying around that's just pretty much garbage or going to be waste anyway. So I've used maple, pine, cherry, um, I've used plywood, I've used MDF, and I've never had a problem with any of those. But again, take a look online and kind of see what you're comfortable with and do what's, what you think is best for you. It's just because I haven't had a problem with it doesn't mean it's not something that might be actually problematic. So once we're ready to start stacking, on the first layer, I keep it off the ground a little bit. Since I'm indoors, I'm not too worried about the elements underneath it, but it helps to be raised off the ground a little bit to add a little more airflow along the bottom. Now, if you're gonna be stacking outside, I'd recommend uh, raising them at least eight inches off the ground. That just helps to keep a little more air along the bottom. And if there's any kind of rain or anything where there might be water somehow underneath the stack, that way the wood is nice and raised above that and it really is out of the way and isn't gonna get wet or damaged. So you can go ahead, you can start stacking your lumber do a layer, put your stickers down, another layer, stickers, kind of like making lasagna. <laughs> Just layer after layer after layer. And then when you get to the top, when you run out of boards, put down some more weight. So what I do is I throw some more dry lumber on top and that helps to weigh down the stack, at least the boards towards the top of the stack. And that helps to keep them flat and pressed down to the form you want to keep them in, which is hopefully your nice flat foundation that you created on the first step. <laughs> now it's time to wait. So that dry time is going to be directly influenced by a few different variables, mostly the airflow. Now the airflow is going to be impacted by things like the thickness of the sticker, how wide the stack is or how much distance this, the air has to go through to get to the other side, as well as the actual airflow itself. If there's any driving force pushing air through it, such as a fan or if you have it outside a nice breezy spot, that's going to help with the airflow. And the biggest component that goes into airflow that's going to impact the dry time is how dry that air is going into the stack. So if that air is really, really dry and it's nice and warm, that the water is just going to be just jumping out of those boards. Now, on the other hand, if the air is really cold or it's really damp, it's not going to pull out more, much moisture out of the stack and take the water out of the wood. So what you're looking for is the time when the air has the most potential to absorb moisture. And that is going to be at room temperature or warmer, so warmer temperatures and lower humidity levels. So you have that sort of in an inverse if you are drying outside or in like the natural environment, so to speak. That's why I love drying in my basement because it gets the best of both worlds. You get that dryness of like right now with winter, the air is very, very dry here in Minnesota, but outside it's freezing cold. So that means that the air outside doesn't really have any capacity for moisture at this point because it's so cold. And if you leave your boards outside over the winter here, not really going to dry much at all, if any. 
On the other hand, if you were able to have that same humidity level, that really, really dry air, but also have it be nice and warm, then the moisture is just going to be jumping up out of the boards and into the air, which is exactly what happens inside my basement. The basement is really dry year round because in the summer I have a dehumidifier in there and it's always at room temperature. So it dries really, really fast inside of the, inside of the basement. Now this method of stacking lumber is generally referred to as the American style. There's another style called the European style that I'll also show you today. Okay, so this style of stacking is generally referred to as the European style. As you can see, the log is cut into slabs and the edge is left on the boards and then the whole log is reassembled in the same order as it was cut and that allows the water or the rain to actually cascade and and shed right off the edge of the log. So something like this can be left out in the elements as it is here in this case and the rain and the snow will just melt or flow right off the edge of it. So the real big advantage to this style of stacking is that those boards are kept in the same order and that way if you are maybe if you're selling your boards or something like that it's really easy to grab all of the same boards from the same log this way now the really big downside to this is space it takes up a lot more space and it's not as, as uniform as the other way of stacking it where you have all the edges removed and it's all on one stack but if you don't have anywhere to store the wood and you just want to put it out in the yard this is a great way of doing it now let's go back inside because it's really cold. It's like literally it's two degrees out today and it's I'm just freezing <laughs> already. Now the general rule of thumb you might have heard for air drying lumber is going to be one year per inch of thickness. And that is, well, <laughs> in the worst case it's true, but typically it's not. For me, in my basement, when I do my drying, it is going to be three to four months per inch, which is extremely fast. Outdoors, they're probably more like nine months or something like that. Now that rule is certainly great and it certainly works if you just want to guess at when your wood is dry. But if you want to know a little bit more about when it's actually dry, you're going to want to get yourself a moisture meter. Now I have two moisture meters here. This is a cheaper one, it's about $30. And this is a much more expensive one, about $200. This is going to be a lot more accurate than this one. And I'll tell you why. This one takes into account the actual density of the wood. And that is going to make it a lot more accurate. This one doesn't. It just tells you what the moisture is as far as you can get these pins into the wood. Now this is a pin style meter. You have to insert these pins into the board and hopefully you can penetrate these pins deep enough into the wood to get a good uh, reading. This is a scanning meter. It's actually um, magic. <laughs> I'll say there's some kind of electronics in here that emits a little field and measures the resistance just like this one does in the wood. And all I have to do with this is just set it on the wood and it'll tell you the moisture content of that wood. Now if you really actually want to know the percentage of the moisture of your wood, you're going to want to get a nicer meter, either this style here, the scanning one, or a nicer pin one, and that'll actually tell you the actual moisture content of your wood. And that's, that's nice to have. For me, it's handy to have because I sell my lumber and people want to know what the actual moisture content is. But you don't need to know the moisture content of your wood because you know, or you probably have, a sample that is totally dry. So a really handy trick for one of these meters is keep a piece of wood that you know is dry with your stack. When the reading from this matches your stack, your wood is dry. And it doesn't matter what the number is. You don't care because you know it's dry. Or it's as dry as it's gonna get. Now this is just really scratching the surface of drying your own lumber. And it's really just my experiences in doing it myself, which has only been a few years. There's a lot more information out there on the internet and I encourage you to take a look around and kind of see what other information is out there. There's a lot of information about this kind of stuff and it's really, it can be a really, really uh, dense topic. But if you really want to get started in drying your own lumber, I would recommend starting with a narrow stack, maybe only two feet wide, and going with a three quarter inch thick sticker. Really hard to screw that up. <laughs> now I'll leave links in the description for the moisture meters and the anchor seal. And those links to the Amazon pages, those are all affiliate links. So if you head over there and you buy anything, that'll be helping out the channel. And I greatly appreciate that. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are going to have a lot of great questions about this topic. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave those down in the comments below. I'll be happy to take a look at those and answer any questions you might have, to the best of my ability, at least. <laughs> so thank you, as always, for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If, as I mentioned, if you have questions about anything I talked about today, please leave me a comment. Of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time... Happy woodworking.